The Your Safe Space podcast is recorded on Wurundjeri land. This podcast acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of the land. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome to Your Safe Space, the podcast. I'm your host, Adele Marie, and this podcast is here for you. It is a safe space for us to catch up each week to discuss anything and everything. And on today's show, we are doing an AMA on air. Ask me anything if you don't know what that means. Happy Friday, guys. Thank you so much for coming back. And congrats on making it through another week, another cold week. I don't know about anybody else, but in Melbourne, the weather is very, very chilly. And I feel like winter is already here. So we're just struggling through it. But I I hope that your week has been good and I hope there's been some highlights or silver linings and I'm not sure right now where you're listening from, if you're at the gym, if you're in the car, if you're on a walk or maybe you're at home doing some errands, but I'm proud of you for making it through. Now, our Friday episodes are my favorite because these are the short, sharp, juicy ones and I love them and we have some really good questions today. Obviously, you know the drill. This podcast is not a replacement for professional mental health help or support and if you do need that, please check the show notes. All right, let's get into it. Question number one, is it socially acceptable to date slash see a guy that's younger than you? Do people think it's weird? Now, I wish this listener gave me more context, like how big the age gap was, because I feel like maybe that could have potentially swayed my answer. But I also don't know if other people think it's weird. And maybe this is like a poll that we put to the community. I personally don't think it's weird. And... I think the reason I don't think it's weird is because my mum is actually older than my dad. So if you guys have watched some of my YouTube videos, you will know that mum is like three and I don't know, a half years. We'll call it four years. Let's just round up. She hates it when I do that. But she is older than dad and I've never noticed the age gap ever. I mean, my dad is quite immature at the best of times. If you've seen my TikToks, you'll know what he's like, main character always. But I've never really noticed that much of a difference between them. And I don't think it's had a negative impact on their relationship. Obviously, that probably makes me a little bit biased. For myself, though, I think I did a little bit of reflection on this question because you guys might even know this, but I've struggled in the past to date guys that are younger than me. And I remember when I first started dating again after my last relationship, there were there were, were two guys that I had gone on dates with and I think one was like 26 and one was like 25 and I think I was like 28, 29 and I, I don't know why, but I was just, it was giving me the ick for some reason and I think so there's obviously some deep rooted stuff that I have to unpack there where I just think I have to date a go- an older guy and so I don't think it's weird for others, but I do think for myself, it's not something that I can do and I don't know why I have that idea in my head and I think yeah, I wouldn't bat an eyelid if it was like a friend dating a younger guy. I don't judge my mum and my dad for their age gap. But as for this question, I think it is socially acceptable. I don't know if people think it's weird, but I did do a bit of research because I was curious. I was curious to see what the internet thought. And there are a few different rules out there. I don't know if I subscribe to them, but I'm going to share them with you today. The first one is that the internet says the appropriate age is half your age plus seven years. And that's the socially acceptable minimum. Now, I don't know if I agree with that because for me, half my age, 30, 15, add seven is 22. I don't know if I would date a 22 year old being 30 myself right now. The other research said that one to three years is preferred. That's like the most digestible. And I would probably say I agree with that a little bit more, but anything over 10 is not as easily digested, which I think fair. I think there's also the other element where the older you get, the less the age gap matters. And I think if you're looking at someone who is say 50 and then 50 or 50 and then 45, that age gap is not as significant as maybe someone who's 25 and 20. And I would say that even five years is probably not that bad, but I think the older you get, the less it does actually matter. Now, the other point I wanted to make on this question is I feel like when men date much younger women, that is more accepted. And I think it's spoken about a little bit more in the media. And there are two examples I'm going to give you. Leonardo DiCaprio and George Clooney, they've both been scrutinized for dating much younger women and they still do it. And I think George is 62. I'm pretty sure I did my research for this episode and his wife, Amal, is 45. Do the math there. That's a very big age gap. But again, I think because they're older, it kind of 
does it really matter? I don't know. And then we have Leonardo DiCaprio, who's 48 years old. What the fuck, by the way? Doesn't that make you feel old? And there's this running joke that all of his girlfriends never get over the age of 22. And I haven't seen too much discourse with women dating younger men in the media or in the, in the spotlight. And so my advice for this listener is if it works for you, and you click and you're comfortable with the age gap and you're obviously of age and consenting and your partner's of age and consenting, then who cares what people think? Do what you want. And I would actually love if we had any listeners in the group who do have a younger partner, come in, share with us your age gap, share with us how you've navigated it and maybe give this listener some evidence because I feel like she might need it. All right, guys. Question number two, how do I support my friend during a breakup? And I love this question because you sound like an amazing friend. And I think I've been the friend to watch my friends go through a breakup. I've also been the friend to go through the breakup and have had my friends have my back. And I think if I look at my own behavior, I'm quite a protective friend. (laughs) If any of my friends get hurt, I'm like, oh, we ride at dawn. But I just want to kind of stop the pain and make them feel better. And I think if I look back to my last breakup, my best friends during that, were my rock. And I think they are the blueprint because if it wasn't for them, I don't know if I would have made it out the other side the way that I did. And so shout out to them, all of you. I love you. But here are some of the things that my friends did that I think helped me. And like everything, obviously this is like relative to my experience. There might be other things that your friends have done. Always come into the group and share them with us. I love hearing what other people do or how other people process and maybe how your friends helped you in a way that my friends didn't help me. Okay. The first thing that they did that I loved is that they checked in on me and it wasn't annoying. It was just nice because I felt like they were there. They asked me what I needed and some of them just like surprised me in ways that I like never imagined or even asked for. Some of them sent me flowers. One of my friends, I remember I was like 12 hours into the breakup and she's like, check your front door. She had Uber Eats me tubs of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And I was just bawling my eyes out because I was like, this is so fucking cute. And it really did play into that crying, eating ice cream out of the container. But my friends let me take the lead. They let me explain to them and articulate to them what I needed. And the whole entire time, I knew that they were there because they were constantly checking in on me. They also did this thing where they encouraged healthy coping behavior. And so I had friends because we were in lockdown at the time. They offered to take me on picnics. They offered to come with me to go for a walk. They offered just to come over and like, let me cry and like talk about it. Beautiful. Love them for that. And I think what I loved about that is they didn't, and obviously we couldn't, it's not like we could go clubbing or out drinking or out and partying heavy and taking drugs. But but I like that they didn't encourage that behavior because I feel like maybe those things would have left me feeling worse given how vulnerable and sad I was. They also did not do the I told you so. Now, (laughs) I know some of our friends date guys or date people that aren't right for them. And it can be really hard, but try not to trash the ex. Try not to talk shit about them. And It can be difficult and I even have to catch myself when I'm the one watching a friend go through a breakup because sometimes I do want to do that. But it's really important that you try and just validate your friend. And that's what my friends did for me. I felt validated. I felt seen. They let me feel my pain and they didn't make me feel bad for for being sad. (laughs) They didn't make me feel bad at all. They just kind of let me be hurt and were there for me. They also let me talk about it until I was done talking about it. And let me tell you, I was fucking annoying. And I'm so sorry to any of my friends listening to this, but I did not shut up about it. And you will know if you've gone through a breakup, that feeling of like, oh my God, I just can't stop thinking about what happened, what he did or blah, blah, blah. And so that's all I could talk about. I was in the thick of it and that's all I had to say. And I talked about it over and over. They never rushed me. They let it take its time. They were patient with me and I never heard once like get over it or like you shouldn't be crying about this. Never. I just felt very like seen and validated, which I loved. And they're probably my top, top tips. Obviously, there's a whole heap more and I would love to for you guys to come and share them. The other thing I want to touch on is the fact that sometimes our friends, when they're going through something like this, may actually push us away. And sometimes I've been the friend to push my friends away or sometimes I've been pushed away and my advice here is don't take it personally 
because grief can do really fucked up things and grief can make us act in a certain way, can make our friends act in a certain way, especially when they're hurt or in a lot of pain. And so my advice is to give them grace, give them time and just let them know that you are going to be there when they are ready. Again, guys, I would love to hear from you. What did you do to help your friends or what did your friends do to help you? Come and join us in the group so that we can chat about it. Question number three. I love the mix of questions in this episode, by the way. How many dates do you go on before you call it for not feeling anything? And I love this question because I feel like I've done my fair share of dating in my 20s. And this is also quite personal, but I feel like with everything, what works for you is the right thing to do. But I personally can tell by like the third or fourth date. And I would love to know what you guys think, but... Before my last breakup, I think I was probably a little more harsh in the sense that I used to say that I could tell on date one. So I would have a date and if it was bad, I'd be like, no, fuck this. Like I'm not doing this anymore. I would make my call straight away. But I realized after being so deeply hurt in that breakup and then dating differently since then, for me, I'm like a slow burn person now where I do actually need to take a little bit of time to get to know somebody. And it takes time for me to kind of let my walls down too. So for me, date one isn't really a good place for me to measure it or make a judgment on a person. And that's because I feel like on date one, everyone's on their best behavior. (laughs) Date one is like everyone's showing up, putting their best foot forward. Date one is a little bit shallow, even in like conversation or getting to know the person. You're not really having a DNM on date one. And I feel like nerves can play a huge part in this too, where Nerves can either make you feel unnatural or them feel unnatural. People can act like how they're not usually. And so I think by date two, that can tend to settle. And I feel like if you are like me and you feel like you're a slow burn person, then date one is probably not enough information to call, to make that call and make that decision. So some examples of this in the past is where I've had like really awkward first dates in a way that just kind of left me feeling unsure in the sense that like, I liked the chat, but like some things were a bit like off, but I thought like, he's a nice guy. So let's just like give it another chance. And so I've then gone on to give it like a second or third date. Obviously with everything, there's like a spectrum and a side note to that, there's exceptions to the rule. And sometimes there are going to be first dates that you go on, or there are going to be first dates that I go on where I know that it's like a red flag immediately. And I know that this is not going to go any further. So if I'm unsure or curious, I tend to go on the second or third date. If I'm given the ick straight away or it's just a big red flag, then I'm likely to call it quits then. And I want to say that because if you aren't feeling it, don't be afraid to call it quits. At the end of the day, you know you better than anybody else. You can trust your gut instinct. I can't tell you that. And when you know, you know, right? And so I think for me as someone who, not that I like doubted my decision making, But I guess while I was rebuilding that trust with myself, it did help to kind of go on a little bit, like go on more dates so that I could practice dating and get to know somebody and really make that judgment with all of the information. I also feel like there's something to be said here about the spark and feeling that, I guess, I don't know what you want to call it. It's called the spark, but that is another question. And I just want to touch on it in this one very briefly, because I feel like as someone who used to look for the spark, I don't look for that anymore. And I feel like that spark can often be undercover for like anxiousness or nerves or worry. And now instead, or what I had done previously while I was dating is look for calmness, look for peace, look for safety, look for ease. Obviously, making sure I have chemistry with the person, making sure that I'm vibing with them and that I'm attracted to them and that I have that connection with them. But I'm not so interested in that spark anymore. And I think that spark in the past maybe led me down pathways or relationships that didn't really serve me. So obviously, you know you best at the end of the day. I'm not going to say that my rule is the hard and fast rule. Like anything, take my advice with a grain of salt. Take everyone's advice or things you see on the internet with a grain of salt. Figure out what is that comfy spot for you and go from there. I'm going to wrap this by saying, as I said, no rules, especially in dating, but come into the group as well and let me know what you think. 
We then have our fourth and final question, which is a therapy one. And I'm so excited for this one. I want to go to therapy, but I can't afford it. Do you have advice for what I should do? And we haven't had a therapy question in a little while, but I wanted to put this in because mental health is so important. You guys know I love talking about it. I have no issues sharing when I have a therapy appointment or how I'm honestly going with my mental health. And I think every time we talk about it, the fact that it's so inaccessible for so many people, especially here in Australia, is so important. I think there is that barrier where it is really expensive to get help for your mental health, especially if you need therapy, especially if you need medication, especially if you are financially stressed. And it's so common for so many of us. And I think Every time I talk about therapy, I note my privilege. I always say I'm so privileged to access it. And it's like a privilege to be able to look after my mental health in that way. But I wanted to put this question in here because there are so many free or low cost options out there. And we're going to talk about them today. Now, as always, in every single episode, I actually have links to mental health help in the show notes. That's just given the fact that I feel like our podcast does touch on mental health quite a bit. And I know the people listening might need that. So that's always going to be there. You can check the notes. They're going to be in there again today. But we obviously have the obvious ones out there, which are our free hotlines. I'm talking things like Lifeline, Beyond Blue, Men's Line, Black Dog Institute, 1-800-RESPECT. These are all free and available to you whenever, wherever. Obviously, I understand that those can be kind of like one one off and you can't get that continued support from somebody through those services, but they are a good option if you are needing immediate help. Secondly, you can chat to your GP or your doctor for a recommendation or a referral to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, and they can look to put you on a mental health care plan. Now, I am on a mental health care plan, and what that essentially means is that you can then go and see a psychologist and through Medicare can get a rebate on the service. So I can't remember off the top of my head how much I pay for therapy, but I think I get up to half of it back from Medicare. It's still quite expensive after that, but chat to your GP and depending on who you are seeing, it can depend on the amount of rebate that you get back. So I know some people who I know personally who go to therapy on a mental health care plan and they don't pay anything. And I don't know if it's because the difference of provider that they're seeing versus the psych that I'm seeing, but there are options out there for lower cost ones if you need that. My next tip is to look at local community health services. Now, there's a website that I'm going to link in the notes. It's called Ask Izzy, and they can locate free mental health help services located near you. So you just pop in your postcode. There's also a whole heap of other help in this website. There's um, financial help, like food help, things like that. Ask Izzy, and that'll be in the show notes as well. There's also a registry, which I will link. It's called Good Therapy Directory, and you can search for any mental health care providers who bulk bill, which is obviously fantastic, or those who have lower fees. I then found something even better in my research for this episode, and it's from Beyond Blue, and shout out to them because they're doing God's work, but they have a service called New Access, which is a free mental health guided six-session self-help program. It has been developed by Beyond Blue, and it's delivered by mental health service providers. It's delivered totally free and without a GP referral, so you don't even need to go to the doctor. I'm going to link that in the notes for you as well. You just pop in your postcode, you can pick a provider and go from there. The other amazing thing is that there's an option for like individuals and then there's an option for small business owners because I feel like obviously owning a business is really hard as well. And so if you guys are needing that help, you can access that completely free too. Another tip is EAP. Some of you might not know about this, but EAP is Employee Assistance Programs, which is a confidential counseling service offered to you by your employer. So I don't know where you work. Again, if you're self-employed, obviously go down that new access path. But every single previous employer that I had in the past had an EAP service and it is completely confidential. It is completely free. It's there to help your well-being in the workplace. And it doesn't necessarily mean that what you're going through has to be related to work. I'll give you an example. In my second last job, I worked for Origin Energy, shout out to them, ASX listed company. They did really look after me. I was involved in a very serious car accident at work. Yes, I was in a work car. The accident wasn't my fault. It was a head-on collision. And after that, I was obviously quite distraught and distressed from the accident. And part of my care was going to the EAP service through my work. And it was totally confidential. 
obviously I got referred to go to that by my boss at the time. And I'm glad that I did because I was able to talk to someone. I think I had maybe three or four sessions. And thanks to that, I was able to then get back in the car and drive again because I was really scared to drive after that accident. And I was able to kind of work through it with that EAP. So it definitely works and it's there and you guys should be able to access it. And hopefully your employers have that available for you. And then lastly, if you are in school, there should be a school counselor who you can see confidentially as a student as well. So I'm not sure if you can chat to somebody at school, whether it's like the nurse or your teacher, see if you can chat to a counselor there and they might be able to provide you some assistance. Obviously, guys, I'm going to link all of this in the show notes. As I say, always, if you need this, please check them. There is help out there and you don't have to battle or fight any of the things that you're fighting by yourself. We are going to wrap the show here. I hope that you have a great weekend. I will see you on Sunday. If you're not already, please follow us on Instagram, Your Safe Space Pod. Join us on Facebook, Your Safe Your the <laughs> your safe space podcast community and leave us a review on Apple. Leave us a rating on Spotify. It goes a long way. And please, please tag us in your story while you are listening. If you just finished listening to the app, take a picture, show me what you're doing, whether you're walking with your dog or you're at the gym or whatever. I like to see it and it really helps me because word of mouth helps this podcast more than you know. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.